They say you are what you eat, so I don't eat chicken feet. But I love me some of Grandma's pickled beets. Well, cut it up, put it in the pan, throw it over your shoulder and see where it lands right here in the farmer's kitchen. Baiters, taters, beans and corn, the cows in the barn and the sheep's been shorn, kids in the barnyard chasing Grandpa's chicken. Chicken, chicken. Spices, slices, cuts and dices, gonna slash your grocery prices right here in the farmer's kitchen. Help you grow your garden good with recipes to suit your mood. Try some grub you've never tried before. Smash it with a wooden mallet, gonna educate your palate. Right here in Farmer's Kitchen, in Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. We're gonna cook something good now. Funding for Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen brought to you by... L81 Bottling Company. Taste, love, and share the tradition. Harvest Energy Solutions. Harvest cabins when you absolutely have to get away. House warmings, meeting all of your outdoor living and fireplace needs. Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development Office. Try something different tonight. Rose Farm Supply. Family farming and commitment to our customers since 1982. Salt Rocks, the flavor of life. Woods Equipment Company has every tool you need to make working the land as rewarding as hunting it. The city of Stanford, Kentucky. Come home to Stanford. Good Foods Co-op. Marksbury Farm Market. Weisenberger Mill. Your village shop. Hello and welcome to Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. Hi. Who are you? Nikki. Do you remember Nikki, me? Do yeah. you come here often? I hang out here once a week, usually. This is my wife, Nikki. I think you know that if you watch our show regularly. You know what? This is going to be one of those shows that people are going to talk about. I have wanted to watch and find out for years. We've done a hog killing. Right. We watched from the, from the snout to the tail. Mm -hmm. We watched them take a pig apart and show where each part is and what they use it for. It's time to do a cow. Yum. I like my beef. I do too. You know, I want to know where every section is, show where the brisket is, show where the ribs are. Well, obviously we know where the ribs right. are. But I mean, show each cut, and we're going to do that today. But first, some lesser known pieces that have quality meat in them. Have you ever heard of oxtail soup? I've heard of it, but I've never had it. You know, waste not, want not. There is so much meat and so much quality meat. Back in the day, when they were slaughtering buffalo wholesale on the plains. What a horrible tragedy yeah. that happened. But something they hardly ever left behind was the tongue. I'm gonna start that soaking in the brine here in a minute, but you know what, let's go right now to Northern Garrett County and watch how a cow is taken from the field to the butcher shop. Hope you brought some home. Mm. Yay. <laughs> This is something I've wanted to do for a long time. I had to get up mighty early to do it. But how many of you out there would like to see a beef cut up and know every part and piece thereof and how it's taken apart? And today we have Leonard and Mark. We're in Northern Garrett County. And I have to... How do I look? Looking good. <laughs> you like it? Uh, behind door number one, we have... Ta-da! Boy, I wish I was taking that home with me today. So, we have uh, Bluegrass Farms here. That's the BFW. We have an individual lot number, which is assigned to each animal. And uh, this is the first side of uh, two sides of this beef. So this is uh, our variety of meats. We have uh, a tongue, kidneys, oxtail, heart, and liver. Mark uh, is writing down all of our information. We take temperatures to monitor uh, the temperature of the carcass to make sure we're meeting USDA requirements. Right. What happens during the aging process? What do you want to happen during the aging process? So what process? we want to, to happen during the aging process is uh, let Mother Nature take its place and uh, break down the muscles and the meat and the fat and, allow it to be a more tender, tasteful meat for us. So Mark just took off the soot off the beef. Uh, you notice that it's still got the kidneys attached and the soot's 
is to protect the tenderloin in the back here. Uh, we can, you actually use this a lot uh, when you go to your stores and buy bird feed. Uh, people have recipes for lard and other. Uh -huh. So now Mark is taking off uh, the secondary skirt. Of, he's just lining out where he's going to pull it off. And it just pulls right out as he, as he marks it there. Uh, you'll notice that there's a layer of skin that's on both sides of it. And Mark's going to pull those off so it makes a nice tender piece of meat that you can make fajita meat out of, uh, stir fry. And that's what it looks like after the skin's removed and ready to go on your dinner plate. Actually, I'd never ate tongue before working here, but uh, it's actually a very tender piece of meat once you boil it down and skin it out and uh, slice it up. What Mark's doing here is he's going to count up five ribs and cut across, and then he's going to cut up another seven ribs and cut across, and that's the way we can separate the chuck from the rib and the rib from the loin. So Mark's now going to take our brisket saw, and he's going to cut that rib eye down and cut the chuck off so we can lay it on the table. So now what we have is the rib section here and the chuck section here, which uh, is only connected by this single cut here. And he's going to cut that, and we'll move on to it. We're just going to set this rib and uh, short ribs and the rib eye over here for the time being. We'll work on this chuck. And as I was talking about before, he's going to make a cut right here, and we're going to take that brisket off this chuck. So this is what the brisket looks like prior to taking the bone out. And you see it's got a nice layer of fat, which makes it good for smoking and barbecuing. And Brisket is in right now. It is, it is. I think Mark has done this a couple hundred billion times. He's been in the business a long time. This is go to your market. Very nice. Now what we're going to do, we're going to flip this chuck upside down here. And when you're looking at it, there's a blade bone that runs down the middle here, and it separates the chuck from the shoulder. So what he's doing here is he's following that blade bone up, and he's just gonna mark out where that top blade is so he can pull it out. So he's got it marked out, and he's about to pull it off. So this is the top blade here, and if you was to separate this out, this is where your flat iron stakes would come from. So he's going to run down the other side of the blade bone now, and that would be where the mock tender is. It's a uh, fairly lean piece of roast, and it, it's kind of tough, so it, it makes a real good roast that you cook in a crock pot. Or you can see as he's getting to that mock tender, you can see the seam starting to pop away, and he's able to roll that mock tender out of the pocket it's in. Now, how is this marketed? How is that sold if you buy that piece of meat? It'd be, it'd be sold as a, it's a great two to three pound roast for you know, a family to two to four. So now Mark is cutting into the shoulder roast here. This is a great boneless, boneless roast here. You see the seams. All the beef cuts have seams in them, and that's where we try to stay away from marking the meat and scoring the meat so it's not usable. So we have the shoulder clod here. And it's, it's really good for a lot of practical uses. It's a nice big roast, has some fat in it for if you want to smoke it. So it's a beautiful roast. What we have left is the shank, which he's going to be able to take off here, and then the chuck row. He's popping the bone away from the shank and the top blade here. So he's going to finish removing the top blade bone here. You see there's not a whole lot of trim on this bone. Mark has a good sharp knife. That's what I was just thinking. Okay, so he's going to separate that chuck eye and he's going to cut the bone off so we get the neck bones and the chuck row. So what we have here is two pieces left of the chuck of that chuck row. We have the chuck row and the neck bones. He's following the bone down where the neck bones run around the chuck. He's gonna remove the chuck row from the bones here. This would be the equivalent of a Boston butt on a pork. 
So it'd be great for uh, smoking and barbecuing, stew meats. So he's now removing the neck bones where the rest of this will go in the trim and uh, we'll cut the neck bones for stock. So we have the shank that's left here. We'll cut it into two inch portions. It'll be great for braising. So we have a uh, cross cut shank here. Beautiful roast. Yeah, this is uh, kind of the prized portion of the beef here. We have the short ribs and then we have the uh, mm -hmm. prime rib. We can cut it into rib eyes. We can do bone in rib roast, Tommy Hawk steaks, whatever you want. Just put that in my truck. We'll carry it on out for you. So when we look at the rib section here, we have the rib eye, which you can see the eye of the rib eye there. And uh, this would be, we'll remove the chime and we'll make this a boneless rib eye and we'll cut it into six. So he's cutting the short ribs right now. We're cutting them into four inch pieces. have our short ribs here. Mark's going to cut these between the bones to make nice portions for restaurants and uh, retail buyers so that they can sell them. And, uh, it's a great, another great braising meat. Well, we have their prime rib here. So Mark has removed the chine bone off of uh, the rib out here, and he's going to take the bones out, take the back ribs out. We're going to make this into a boneless roast. Again, you see the seams that he's pulling off there. So we got the nice fat cap on the back of the ribeye here. Now he's going to remove the tendon and the back ribs. So now we're left with the, just the tendon left in the ribeye there, which he's removing. And we got our back ribs ready for the grill. So we're ready to cut it into one inch sticks now. I'm impressed. So if we delay these out, you get some beautiful ribeyes. It's really some pretty steaks. Beautiful. And then we have our oxtail here. And I uh, don't know if you guys have ever had oxtail soup, but it's amazing. So you would just put these little segments in your favorite soup, and it really is good. So what he's now is he's getting ready to separate where the loin connects with the round. We have the rose meat on this side, which will go be going to our trim today, but sometimes we harvest that. And on this side, we have our flank steak, which is a great steak for fajita meat and just uh, for your grill. That's what the cut looks like once it's ready to go to the grill. Mark's going to lay it on the table now. So Mark has the round and the loin left here. He's going to separate them, and we're going to separate this round out into different muscles and have the top sirloin steaks. So if you take a look at the inside of this loin here, you can see the tenderloin that we're going to be removing, and that was where the soot was protecting it earlier. So we'll be taking this out and making fillets out of it. Uh, Mark's going to remove the silver skin on it, and he's going to clean it up. So if someone was wanting to buy a whole tenderloin, this is what you'd be buying. So you can see we have some beautiful medallions here. So Mark now is going to remove his top sirloin. This can be used for roast, but today we're going to be cutting it into steaks. So this would be your top sirloin roast if you was going to leave it whole. But we're going to be cutting it into one inch steaks today. So this is our top sirloin steak. This would actually be one of my favorite steaks on the beef. A lot of times you don't have the sinew in the, that you do in the ribeye, you can eat the whole steak. Cost is cheaper. So what he's cutting out now is the tri-tip roast off the sirloin. And it's, a, it's one of those great two to three pound roasts that come off the beef. So if you look at the loin here, you can see it looks a lot like a T-bone. Then we have the, where the tenderloin was, and that would be the porterhouse. So as the tenderloin runs out, it becomes T-bones. But today we're going to be making this into a boneless strip loin and cutting it into one inch steaks. Yeah, so he's removed the T-bone portion from the loin. And so now we have a boneless strip loin. And he's going to be cutting these into one inch steaks. Mark's pretty good at portioning. So if we look at our strip steaks here, got good marbling. It's a good looking steak. 
what we're left here was is the round. We're gonna be separating this into the eye round, the top round, the bottom round. You can see all the seams that he's cutting into to be able to break this muscle apart. Lots of seams in the round. So what he's cleaning up here is the top round. It'd be moving on to uh, we have the gooseneck on this side, which will be broken down into the pop bottom round and the eye round. So this is for your dog if you want to take it home to your dog. <laughs> That's about Moses' size right now. Yeah. So we're left with the, these three sections. This is the gooseneck, the sirloin tip, in the top round. And there's only one thing left to do with the gooseneck, and we're going to separate the eye round out to the bottom round. So if you look at the muscle structure of the round, you can see it's fairly lean muscle here, and that's why it makes it great for stew meats. All we have left of this animal is the shank. We'll be cutting into two inch crosscut shanks like we did before on the chuck. It's fascinating to see how this is done step by step, broken apart, and the animal has seams and guidelines that let you follow and know exactly where to go, and that's how these cuts came about, by following those and pulling out those different meat groups out. Here's what I'm thinking about doing. Oxtail stew and smoked tongue. Huh? Sounds good. You're inviting us for supper, right? Yeah, come on over. <laughs> Man, thank you so much. Thanks. And thank you so much, sir. This was, yeah, a knuckle, knuckle bump. There you go. Absolutely wonderful. Now we know what each particular part is. Thank you guys so much for sharing that with us. Now, if the thought of any of this is it's much more for it than you can bear, then you can take little pieces of, of stew meat and do whatever with this. But this is wonderful meat, this actual tail right here. You gotta cut it up into sections, which we're gonna do in a minute, but okay. let's talk about the tongue. We're gonna to take this tongue and put it in a brine. Now this brine I got from a buddy of mine, it's just a basic brine. I wanna get as much salt into that to get that salty flavor as I can, and you can use all kinds of different things. Eight ounces of soy and some Worcester sour sauce, maybe six ounces of that. Lemon pepper to give it a little zing, a teaspoon of that. A lot of black pepper. We're gonna take some kosher salt probably about a half a cup. Then we're gonna take a little brown sugar for the sweet, I don't know, a third of a cup of that. I never measure anything. So I'm just gonna simply take this tongue. That is huge. That's a big bunch of meat. How could you wow. waste that? I'm gonna put it in the brine, put it in the refrigerator, and let it sit there. And we'll probably go six to eight hours. Now let's go ahead and step you through this process. After you take the tongue out of the refrigerator, take your pot, Put you two beers in it and enough water to cover that up and put you some black pepper and maybe some garlic, a little green onion, something like that. Let it come to a boil and then turn it down and let it simmer for a little over an hour. We'll take it out, rinse it off in cold water, but you can peel that outer layer of the tongue off. Then I'll take and put just a little bit of garlic, a little bit of black pepper and some kosher salt and I'll put it in a smoker. Now it's really cold out. Normally in the summertime I do this about 200 degrees. I'm gonna do it at 225 degrees. And I'm gonna check it at about three hours and something to make sure we have about 175 degree temperature internal on that. Got some olive oil in here. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut this up into sections. Oh, I don't know, three inches long. Okay. And in between the joints here. So start down below. Mm -hmm. Now when you think about the spinal column here, you're just basically cutting in between the pieces of bone there. And we're gonna take these pieces and we're gonna roll them around a little bit of flour. I'll put a little salt and pepper in there. Why in the world would you wanna waste that good meat? Look at that. And look at the nice fat that surrounds it. This is wonderful, flavorful meat. Usually you see me cooking in a dish where stuff goes fairly quickly. We're gonna really let this cook down. Now you're gonna taste the bone. Now in some animals, the bone has a strong taste. Mm -hmm. Goodness, and I don't, I, don't right. want any, I don't want any bone in. But with this. Beef, it's good. How about that smell? It smells delicious. You know what? Really and the thing does. is, about this particular, this particular thing that we're doing, it's a slow cook. All right, real quickly, Nikki, if you will, go ahead and put your goggles on. Onion time? It's onion time. All right, so we're going to take some onions, a couple sticks of celery. Isn't that a nice sizzle? It is. It already smells like heaven in here. And Nikki's cutting up some carrots, which we're gonna go ahead and toss in here. Now, when the onions start to get done here, which they are, they're getting close. Now, it remember, good. remember, this is gonna cook for a long time. All right, let's get our garlic real quick and let's press that into here. Okay. I'm gonna clear me a spot over here on the side. I'm gonna use about, we got some small ones. So I'd say if you got normal size cloves, about four cloves of garlic. 
Now, a lot of stews that I make are not tomato based. This does have some tomatoes in it. It's got red wine and tomatoes. Yummy. Okay, if you will, come back with some paste over here. Right. Let's say three tablespoons. And we're just gonna kinda toast that. There are all kinds of different recipes for oxtail stew, and oxtail soup. This is an easy one. Not quick, but it's easy. Now we're gonna deglaze. Smell this. Smells good. Okay, now here's where we come back with. More wine. Wow. You know the nice dark color yeah. that it has in the end? it makes it so good. Oh yeah. Now, if you don't like alcohol, that will cook out, but the flavor will remain. Now we're gonna come back with beef stock. And I'm gonna do, I don't know, a couple cups of that. And let's come in with about two and a half, three cups of diced tomatoes. You can use crushed. Now they're gonna cook down because it's gonna be in here for a while. All right, now at this point, would you take me some fresh thyme? Okay. A couple tablespoons of that. Okay. I'm gonna take some bay leaves, three bay leaves in there. We're gonna put our meat in here. <laughs> and we're gonna let that go. All right, now at this point, you're gonna salt and pepper to taste. Okay. And you can use as much or a little black pepper as you want. Unless Glenn's been to your house and stolen it all. Because you know how he is about <laughs> yes, pepper. Yes, he loves his pepper. Right, now we're gonna take our thyme. Whose thyme? My thyme. And fresh thyme. That is the key to this. As it cooks down, that meat's gonna start to fall off that bone. But you have to taste of the bone in there. Yeah. That's the best part. Now, as that cooks down, we're gonna let that go for about three, three and a half hours. Let's move that to the stove over here. Alrighty. Now, the next step, you see potatoes laying out here. They're lonesome, they're by themselves, but they will have company in a little while. Okay. We're gonna let that cook down for about three, three and a half hours. We'll remove the meat, take the bones out, take the meat off, leave it in there. And at that point, we'll cut those up and let those get for another 40 minutes or so until that's done. Now look, here's what we're gonna do. If you don't mind holding that. Oh, wow. look at that. And I'll tell you what, put it on a cracker, dip it in a little Dijon mustard. Now this, wow. is, this is as good cold. Just pop that in the refrigerator and just slice it off whenever you want a good snack. And people throw these away. Are you ready? I'm ready. It smells good. That's good. Can you believe that? And again, the internal temperature on this needs to be about 175. Oh, that's just perfect. Beautiful mm. meat. Isn't that wonderful? Thing are looking good. Mm. Now, it's probably a good time to tell about our Facebook page. Check it out, Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen, and like it. Figure out where we're going and what we're doing. And also, timfarmerscountrykitchen.com. You might want to visit that to check out some recipes you've never seen before on our shows. I think there's several hundred out oh, there yeah. now. Several hundred shows of us doing things all over the place. And we're going to be gone for a couple weeks off the air because KET is having their telephone drive. That's right. Now, remember, remember that television like this is made possible by viewers like you. So if you like our show and shows like it, make sure you tell KET that you like them. Look at that. Looks good. That meat is so tender. I love the vegetables too. And we've got the flavor of the bone good. in there. Ready? I'm ready. Taste your sauce. This is worth it. Wait. Oh my goodness. Because you got tomatoes, but you got the beef and the wine. You know, oh, so good. You don't taste all that tomatoey taste. It's it's blended perfect. You did good. You did good. But man, oh man, ooh, is that nice? Vegetables are good. The bone flavor. It's a, it has just a richness that you can't even hardly describe. But man, cook those bones. They're good for you. It's Calcium. Good. Stuff that we're not getting today that I think we need in our bodies. Hey, don't forget, we're gonna be gone for a couple weeks. Ooh, by the time we get back. Might be nice out. You think? I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I've had it with winter. Oh, we got so much fun stuff, gardening tips, just right around the corner if we can hold up. But during Telefun, make sure you support KET. Shows like this made possible by viewers like you. So support KET. Now again, most of the stuff we cook, we really, really like to get it done quick, but this is worth the wait. And speaking of worth the wait, if you just can't wait for us to get back on, check out YouTube again and watch some stuff you've never Good seen idea. before. 
And uh, before we fill our mouths back up, it's pretty much all about good times, good friends, and good eats. We'll see you soon on Tim Weber's Country Kitchen. To order a cookbook or DVD of the show, please call 502-319-0487 or email timfarmerck at gmail.com. Special thanks to Furniture World Superstore, Kinco Farm Fence Supplies, Tater Knob Pottery and Farm. Funding for Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen brought to you by L81 Bottling Company. Taste, love, and share the tradition. Harvest Energy Solutions, harvest cabins when you absolutely have to get away. Housewarmings, meeting all of your outdoor living and fireplace needs. Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development Office, try something different tonight. Rose Farm Supply, family farming and commitment to our customers since 1982. Salt Rocks, the flavor of life. Woods Equipment Company has every tool you need to make working the land as rewarding as hunting it. The city of Stanford, Kentucky. Come home to Stanford. Good Foods Co-op. Marksbury Farm Market. Weisenberger Mill. Your Village Shop.